so inclined to, to share it online, um, was a post about red ants and black ants. And I thought that the post was so relevant to the way things are in our world today. And this is what was said in that post. Said if, if you put red ants and black ants in a jar together, at first nothing will happen. But if you violently shake that jar and then dump the ants back onto the ground, the ants will fight until they have all killed each other. The black ants will think that the, what, the red ants are the enemy and vice versa. When the reality is that the real enemy is the guy who shook the jar, right? And this, this is what is happening in society today. Left versus right, black versus white, uh, pro-mask versus anti-mask, pro-vaccine versus anti-vaccine, conservative Christian versus liberal Christian, and I'm sure the list goes on and on and on. The real question that we should be asking is who is shaking this jar and why? That's the real question we should be asking. Now, for many of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, uh, we know who is shaking the jar and we know why. But for many in our world today, even for some in the church, we act as though the person that is shaking the jar is that other person. You know, the, the one who doesn't look like us, uh, the one who doesn't think or act like we do, that other person who doesn't believe like we believe. You know, the one whose ideas may be a little bit different or plenty different from ours. That other person who has different preferences, they like or dislike different things than we like or dislike. And so we find ourselves engaging in this destructive pattern of perpetuating the, the ever-increasing confusion in our world, just like the one who is really shaking the jar desires for us to be doing. Now, I did mention confusion, increasing confusion, and you may be wondering, what, what confusion is, is he talking about? What, what confusion are you talking about? Well, with modern technology today, it is, it is more possible now than ever before to be well connected, yet the world has never been more disconnected. With a wealth of information at our fingertips, while we should be well informed, we have never been so misguided and so misinformed. With the world of knowledge readily available to many of us, the world today seems to be so far less willing to put that knowledge to good use. With such great access to the global community through social media and technology, human beings seem so much less interested in genuine relationships. Even concerning our current situation, there are so many mixed messages about how best to deal with this pandemic. Between all the fake news, all the conspiracy theories, or the, the actual truth, and what we observe taking place around us, it is quite hard to know what to believe and what not to believe. And the list goes on and on as to how confusing of a world we live in today. Never in my life, never in my life, in my few years of life, has 
life seemed so confusing. The entire world just seems to be an, an enormous entanglement of mass confusion, which only appears to grow worse each and every day. I know that, that many has, in the past, have asked the, the following question, especially during and, and following, you know, every major natural disaster, after every senseless taking of an innocent life, um, at the unexpected loss of a loved one, you know, in the face of apparent global civil unrest during this global pandemic, the one question that I've asked, that I've heard asked many times is, where is God? And why isn't he doing anything about this? Where is God? And why isn't he doing something about all of these things? Well, we are not the first generation of folk to ask this question. We see similar questions being asked numerous times throughout the the, the Old Testament by a few notable people in scripture such as Job, such as David and, and even Habakkuk. As we continue this Sabbath to explore the modern message of the minor prophets, uh, today we will take a look at the message of Habakkuk the prophet um, as we explore how God calls us to trust Him and to evaluate the reality of what is going on in, in the world around us, not based on our own observations and wisdom, but rather on the Word of God. And so my message today is titled, Navigating Through All the Confusion by Faith. Navigating through all the confusion by faith. Dear Father, we need your Holy Spirit at this time to speak your truth to us. And so, may the words that are spoken here today be from you to each and every heart that hears my voice. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you want to turn with me to the the minor prophet Habakkuk. Now I, I recognize that a lot of these minor prophets are not books that we regularly read and so this I'm sure would be one of those books where the pages are still stuck together as well. Right? And so let's take advantage of this opportunity to get those pages separated from each other and and let's explore this message of, of Habakkuk. So Habakkuk chapter 1. I will begin there. I want you to follow along as I read. I'm going to read from verses 2 to 4. Habakkuk chapter 1. He says, How long, Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has become perverted. Now let's jump over to Habakkuk chapter 2, and I'll continue reading there verses 2 to 5. And the Lord answered me, Write this vision, 
make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come, it will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as Sheol. Like death he has, ne he, he has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own, all peoples. We see Habakkuk at the beginning of his, his book here, um, a lament about what he sees happening in Judah, and he is essentially, as you know, as we, we read it, he's, he's more or less yelling at God and complaining to God about the, the violent society Judah had become. It seemed to him that God was totally ignoring his cries out to him for help, and he wanted God to put an end to the confusion in Judah, but it just did not seem like God was listening to him. The words Habakkuk uses to describe what he sees going on around him I believe would accurately describe what is going on in our world today. Uh, we see words like evil deeds or wrongdoings, trouble, misery, destruction, violence, arguing, fighting, contention, and we see this being heightened, these things that, that we see happening. We see it being heightened by a global pandemic and political unrest in addition to the social injustices on, on many levels. And just like many today are outraged by what is taking place, Habakkuk was outraged by what he saw happening around him. However, we see God responding to him, but his response to Habakkuk's complaint only adds to the confusion. And I, I would encourage you, you know, when you, you leave here today, uh, not now, but when you leave here today, to read through the, the book of, of Habakkuk. It's, it's interesting, uh, the, the dialogue that's taken place between this prophet and, and God. Right? We, we see God responding to Habakkuk, and, but his response only adds to the confusion. Habakkuk just could not understand why it is God would, would see it fit to use a nation that was so much more evil than Judah to punish his own people. And his lament, Habakkuk's lament, continues with further challenges to God about his response. And after a second set of complaining, um, Habakkuk says in, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer concerning my complaint. Now, to me, it's, it's really clear that Habakkuk has a, a good relationship here with God. Um, we see him complaining. We see God responding. We see this dialogue happening. And not just any you know, relationship, but one that was deeply personal. To the extent that we see this, this dialogue. Um, we see God desiring a very similar, deeply personal relationship with each and every one of us today. 
when we consider the, what God has done for us, what He is doing and what He said He is going to do, um, we know that, that He desires this deeply personal relationship with us as well. Now God begins His second response to Habakkuk in chapter 2, in verses 2 to 5, which I read earlier. And we see three specific instructions being communicated to, to Habakkuk by God. Three things that are very necessary for us today as we navigate through the, the confusion that surrounds us, the confusion in our world today. The first thing that he commands Habakkuk to do was to write. Right? You following? The first thing he says to Habakkuk is write. In verse 2 of chapter 2, he says, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. This, this command to write is a command that we see throughout Scripture um, being given to various other prophets. Um, for example, uh, Moses in Exodus 17 verse 14, God tells Moses uh, in, in response to, to Joshua leading an army against the Amalekites and, and returning victorious, God tells Moses, write this down on a scroll as a permanent reminder. Write it down on a scroll as a permanent reminder. We see a very similar command being uh, given to Isaiah in chapter 30 verse 8. He says, and now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Another person we see being given the same command is Jeremiah in chapter 36 verse 2. He is told, take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you uh, from the days of jo Josiah until today. In the New Testament we see John. John the, the Revelator, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, and to Smyrna, and to Pergamon, and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Again in Revelation, we see another command to write being uh, in Revelation 21, verse 5, saying, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy. And true. See, it, it, the, the significance of, of recording these prophecies to be shared with others brought validity um, to what was said against its subsequent fulfillment. Right? It was necessary for people to see that God said it would happen as they were seeing it happen, happening. And so it was very important to have it clearly recorded and easy for all to read. Equally important to me are the times when God either did the writing himself, as we see him doing in the, the Ten Commandments, when he wrote the Ten Commandments himself on, on tables of tablets of stone, or when God said that he will do the writing, such as on the tablets of our hearts. As we see in Jeremiah 31 verse 33, we see God saying, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, 
and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. If it's one thing that needs to be absolutely clear during the times in which we are living, is that God has written His laws and on our hearts. We see Jesus saying to the disciples in John 13 uh, verse 35, He says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now more than ever, people need to know that you love just like Jesus loves. This is how we help each other and this is how we help those around us navigate through the confusion of our day. As we continue to go through the things we are experiencing today, let us continue to allow God to continue His work in us. Let us not deter the continued writing of His words in our hearts. For the etching of His words in our hearts will prepare us for even worse experiences than what we are experiencing now as we draw nearer to the end of our journeying here on earth. The next thing we see God telling Habakkuk to do is to wait. Right? He tells him to wait. In verse 3 of chapter 2, he says, The vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently. For it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Now, I know that you know, God may seem a little bit slow at times, but He is never late. He never delays in order to hurt us or to deprive us of, of happiness or of the things that we need. Because we know that His real desire for us is to save us all. He is a God who is always right on time. And so, he wants us to trust him and to wait patiently for him. We see David in Psalm 27 declaring a very similar sentence of, of encouragement as he too expressed frustration about his enemies continual, continually coming after him. He says in, in Psalm 27 verses 13 and 14, I would have despaired unless I have had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then he continues to say, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Now, I, I get that the extended period of, of isolation, the constant changes in measures to be followed, this apparent endless ongoing of a pandemic is, is wearing us thin. I get that. I've noticed that, that people seem to be, be angry for no apparent reason, I've heard that depression and other mental health challenges are higher than ever before and that domestic violence is reported to be at an, at an all-time high. Through all of this, I see trust for one another seeming to be slipping out the door and the confusion to be ever-increasing. I know that we're all tired of this. I'm, I'm kind of tired of, of this. And we want it all to be done already. But our Heavenly Father commands us to wait. He encourages us to be strong and courageous and to keep waiting 
because the end will certainly come. Then we see God bidding Habakkuk to remember. Remember in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 2, it says, See, the enemy is puffed up, his desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his faith. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest. Because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied, he gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. And so God reminds Habakkuk that the evil one will never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. He desires greater evil and he will not, he will not quit with the trials, with the temptations, with the distractions, with the devastation, he will not quit until he has you and I right where he wants us, dead and lost. I am so grateful that the Lord has such a desire for each and every one that is so much greater. And that He has made it possible for us to be in right living with Him. He tells us that the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by His faith. In contrast to, to the enemy who seeks only after his own desires, we see the righteous enjoying proper judicial standing before God because of his son Jesus Christ. And as a result of allowing God to write his law in their hearts, and because they allow their trust in him to grow as they wait on him, we see God's righteous standards being made their own and being reproduced, reproduced in their lives. We see the Apostle Paul echoing this, this very fact, saying in Romans 1 verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in His sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. I read somewhere this week that about 10% of everything that Jesus says in the Gospels was a quote from Scripture. About 10% of everything that Jesus says in the Gospels is a quote from Scripture. Jesus, we see Jesus himself demonstrating having the law written in his heart, recognizing its power for salvation. Not for his own salvation, but for yours and mine. We, uh, sorry, he recognized that having the gospel etched in our hearts would provide the necessary reminders exactly when needed to help us overcome temptation, to help us remember who we are in Christ, to help us know love shown to us to help us know the love shown to us, that we may show that same love to others. This same gospel, by the power and leading of the Holy Spirit, helps bring us into a right relationship with the only one who can save us, so that we can live faithfully through all of the chaos around us. So let us remember then to trust in Jesus Christ, 
who immersed himself fully in the word of God to save us even through all of the confusion. And let us remember to trust Jesus Christ by immersing ourselves in the word of God to honor him as we live by our faith. One of, one of my professors uh, during my, my master's degree, one of my, pre one of my professors during my master's degree shared an experience of his that immediately came to my mind as I began to, to prepare this message from, from Habakkuk. He shared that his wife, he and his wife had gone to Chicago for a parade. Now, I don't recall what the parade was, was for, what, what type of parade it was. I do remember, though, that it was a big deal because he said that the sidewalks were totally crowded, extremely packed. And when they were able to find a place on the sidewalk where they could, could see some of the parade, the extent of their viewing was just about a few meters wide. A very limited view of what was, was actually happening, right? Someone suggested to them that if they went to a particular building and went up a few stories high, uh, that they would have a much better view. And so they went to where they were told to go and the view from there was so much better. They could now see just about the entire parade from one end of the street to the other. They had a whole new perspective of what was going on. In this book of Habakkuk, we see him expressing his frustrations to God out of his own observations, out of his own wisdom, out of his own limited perspective of what was going on without any understanding of the big picture of God's grand perspective of what was happening and what God had planned to do to deal with with all of what was taking place our perspective of what is taking place around us is limited just like Habakkuk's perspective was limited and I know that we too, at times, are tempted to hold a fist up at God and are inclined to, to, to tell God how it all needs to go down. Because we think we know better sometimes, because our experience has told us how it should happen. But we are told in Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. So, let us, let us be mindful not to evaluate what we see taking place based on our limited perspective, but rather on the Word of God. Let us not limit what God can do to our experiences or what we have seen Him do in the past or not do in the past or even to our limited knowledge of Him, but rather let us turn to His Word continually. Let us allow His Word to be etched ever deeper into our hearts as He writes as a permanent reminder His law on the tablets of each and every one of our hearts. Let us wait on Him, living by faith, knowing that His soon coming 
is not delayed as some may think it is, but will surely happen. And as we navigate through the chaos, let us remember that God is sovereign. He is fully aware of all that is going on in the world around us, and He is still in full control. We see Habakkuk saying, right at the end of chapter 2, verse 20, he says, But the Lord is in His holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Let us remember to live faithfully, knowing that His soon coming is sure. We get to the end of the book of Habakkuk and we see Habakkuk rejoicing as he reaffirms his trust in God, saying in verses 17 to 19 of, of Habakkuk chapter 3, he says, Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, Though the flock disappears from the pen, and there are no birds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. No matter, no matter how this whole pandemic experience goes, no matter how things turn out at the end of this experience, no matter what the outcome of all the chaos, I trust in God's judgment. I trust in His care for each and every one of us. I trust in the way He is leading in my life and in each of our lives. I trust that He is coming again soon. However, it is my desire today to recommit to journeying with Him daily by my faith in Him. And so, if it is your desire as well, why don't you join me in standing as we, we end with prayer? Dear merciful, gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we see so much going on around us that, that confuses us, dear God. You know, so many mixed messages about what's taking place, um, so many things happening that we just are unable to understand. But we thank you, God, that you know all things that you know the beginning from the end, that you know exactly, dear God, how all things are going to turn out with regards to our current experience, with regards to each and every one of our personal experiences. We are grateful that you know how it's going to go. I want to ask, dear God, that for each of us here today, for each of us, one of us hearing my voice, that we would totally and wholeheartedly surrender our hearts to you, dear God, so that you may continually um, write upon each of our hearts your word, your law. And I pray, dear God, that as a result, dear Father, of growing in our knowledge, growing in our relationship with you, that our faith in you would continually grow and that as we journey through the, the chaos in our world, that we would do so totally trusting you, totally believing in your promises, totally believing, dear God, all that you have 
said to us through your word, all that you have written in our hearts, dear God, uh, may we continue by faith. And so, dear God, today it is our desire to just recommit ourselves to you, dear God, in, in recommitting that our journey with you would be done by faith in you. And that we won't try to do it in our own way, with our own limited understanding, with our limited perception of what is taking place in our world, but that we will do so, dear God, totally upon the words that you have shared with us through your word. Thank you, dear God, for your love and your desire for us. Thank you so much, dear God, that you have made it possible for us to stand righteous before you by your Son, Jesus Christ. And I thank you so much, dear God, that you see it fit to invite us, dear God, into an eternal relationship with you. Thank you so much. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.